Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 228 of the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis, here with a little bit of a cold. I know. Are you Megan Francis? (laughs) I don't know who I am. I'm Froggy (laughs) McGee. That's what I feel like right now. It is the classic uh, fall cold right now that I'm kind of getting over. But I'm also here with Sarah Powers, who is without a cold at the moment. I mean, as of right now, you never know. By the time this drops, who knows? Maybe I will have a cold. (laughs) It It is is that time of year. Totally that time of year. Well, I'm glad you're here anyway. And we had to push off recording by a day. But this is what we do as podcasters. We show up with our froggy voices sometimes. Yes. Yesterday, it would have been not only froggy, but like I couldn't get through more than three words without going... Yeah, it's, it's you know funny. That. Sometimes when I go back for some reason and listen to an oldie oldie episode from the archives, it'll be like, there it is. Like one of us has a hoarse voice or a little tickle. Yep. And yeah, here we are showing up for the people. Here we are showing up. And today <laughs> we're talking about we're just here. Here we are. Um, but we're talking about something that I think is kind of a recurring topic that comes up a lot, but we haven't dedicated a whole episode to it. And that is parenting this idea of being fair and equitable. I think equitable is really the word we're looking mm-hmm. for here. Versus parenting to your child's needs and strengths and kind of their unique personality. And I think that can be a real struggle, especially when kids start noticing that things aren't always same, same. Um, So I know the way we're going to kind of structure this today is that I'm going to kind of ask you some questions you're going to ask me, but it really all stemmed from a listener question that we got um, about parenting fair versus parenting to individual children. And we were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. It's yeah. so funny because I actually, we're going to get into this, but I feel like I am in the thick of this right now um, where the kids are at the ages where it's like, not fair. He got right. more. She go, went first yesterday. And um, we're going to talk about how you come into that and then maybe go out of that again. But Hannah sent in this email and just the way she worded it, I was like, yes, we need to talk about this because Yeah, it is parenting to the individual child's needs versus, and we'll read Hannah's question in a minute, but like, do you, do you set a standard that's always the same in your whole family? Like you get dessert after you eat your vegetables or whatever the thing is, or is it specific to the kid? And I feel like my mind was like, oh yeah, that's a big question. It is a big question. Um, We've also been wanting to kind of tackle the idea of our relationships changing with older kids. We've got a few questions um, about my teenagers and young adults in particular, And we get asked a lot to talk about that. And it's tricky, honestly, like they're in some in some cases, my kids are literally adults and, you know, the younger ones, the younger teens are becoming adults and they're just more sensitive. So we we dance around those topics, but we're going to delve in a little bit more on that today. Yeah, I'm excited about this because, like you said, it's in many cases just not appropriate for you to tell detailed stories about, you know, one particular 15 year old in your house. But at the same time, I'm sure you'll have a lot to say about the way that kind of individual relationship, parent-child relationship changes as they get older. So, yeah. Yep. Sarah, you know when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. 
Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming back Dr. Mom Butt Balm as a sponsor today. And Megan, I guess you must be back to changing diapers again, right? Now that you have a step grandbaby in the mix. I have changed a few lately, Sarah. And yeah, it really takes me back to that memory from early motherhood. I actually always enjoyed diaper changes unless they were the really gross toddler ones or if there was diaper rash involved. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember being so stressed out, like gearing up for the saddest diaper change ever. Your baby knows it's going to hurt. You know they're going to cry. It is just the worst. And having to use goopy, gross diaper rash cream definitely didn't help. Dr. Mom Butt Balm was developed by a mom who's also a doctor when she couldn't find any traditional products that worked for her baby's persistent diaper rash. This pediatrician-approved formula is made with all quality ingredients and no artificial dyes or preservatives. And since it's easy to remove, you won't have to wipe and wipe to get it off of your baby's skin. That is so important, especially if they're already a little chafed. And I love the way this formula feels. A little goes a long way. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, so let's dive right into it by um, reading Hannah's question. It is, hi, Sarah and Megan. Love your show. Have listened to every episode and quite a few twice. Thank you, Hannah. My kids are pretty small still, two under two, but I can already see so many differences in their little personalities and needs. Was wondering if y'all could cover the topic of parenting fair versus parenting to the child. How did you make the distinction on what standards you held as a type of family rule or guideline and in doing so keeping things fair or consistent from kid to kid versus altering expectations to meet the specific child where they are and who and for who they are? Um, and I think, Sarah, like, you know, we're, we're going to kind of start with your your perspectives on this. But one thing that kind of popped out at me as I was reading this question is, do we need to define the difference between fair and consistent? Is consistent even fair? (laughs) You know, so that like, I think that's like the overlying question here. Like, what is fair actually? What is fair? What does that even mean? Well, I can Um, tell you what my mom always said it meant. And I'm sure she got this from somewhere. But fair is not everyone getting the same thing. Fair is everyone getting what they need. What we could end, we could end. I'm sure she got. Okay, we're done. We're done. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) equitable, fair, consistent. But that's why I love the way Hannah worded this because it it, there are layers to this because she's Right. right. There are some family values and guidelines that I think most of us would say that's an absolute in our family. That is the way we do things. And then there's so many things where it's more complicated than that. So first of all, I think it was it was posed so um, eloquently, eloquently, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Well, I don't mind starting. I'll give your voice a break. Thank you. Um, So I had to think about this. And my first comment is uh, this is something I really truly struggle is maybe a strong word, but this is something I think about a lot. My kids are six, nine and 11. And I would say for the last two or three years, uh, this is like the the world I live in. It's where no one is a baby anymore. Everyone is a fully realized child with opinions and the ability to express those opinions. And I have raised good little negotiators. They're good at (laughs) communicating their wants, needs, and desires. And to their credit, they're good at making a case for for what they want from me and from each other. So that's all really good. I feel good about that. But it does mean that a whole lot of my parenting life involves conversations about what is fair, Mm -hmm. equitable, what rule I enforced yesterday. So, you know, some days that's exasperating and some days it's just part of the job. Um, But I just want to validate that if anyone else is in that phase of parenting, 
like I am totally in it. So this was good for me to think about. Um, I think. Can we really yeah. quickly, though, point out that kids are so great at remembering <laughs> yesterday. Like they're so good at remembering what you did for so and so yesterday versus what you did, you know, for them today or whatever. But they're really terrible at remembering what it was like to be a different age yes. or having the mm -hmm. imagination to put themselves forward into mm -hmm. a different age. So you almost have like these two, like this super ability, superpower they have, like competing with this complete disability. Uh, absolutely. And yeah. like if, you, if your kids are spaced like mine, you end up having conversations with a six year old about why she can't do something that an 11 year old is doing. And that's right. like you're like, no, but when she was six, this was not the conversation we were having. Like, right. yeah. So it, it takes up a lot of my mental energy. And I, w I loved thinking about this idea of, you know, having a standard rule versus um, adjusting to the individual child. And I would say that, like most things, I'm not really in either camp, not that there are camps, but I think it's a little bit of both. Um, there are definitely things in our house where it's a, it's a rule or a value. It may be, it's something like that just feels really important to me, like no screens at the dinner table or something like that. Or maybe it's something that makes my life easier just to have an absolute, you know, like no one comes downstairs after 8, 15 PM, whatever it is. So some of those things, I think there are some family rules, but I would say a lot, a lot of it comes down to the individual kid and what they might need or be working on um, mm. at that particular phase of life. Um, I, th I think going back to when they were little, um, I think it would be, it's really hard to have many absolutes when you're parenting like a zero, two and four right. year old. <laughs> like they are the definition of those first three years, I think are, is about meeting individual needs, right? It's like how you yeah. form a bond with your child. It's how they learn to trust you. It's how you get to know them is by they have a need, they express it, you respond, it goes well or it doesn't go well, you adjust next time. But I would say even if you had triplets, you would still be tuned into and responding to individual babies' needs. And mm. so for me, where I felt the real shift from an individual needs response to like, here's our family and here's how we do things was when my kids were about probably three, five and seven, uh, somewhere in there mm -hmm. where the youngest felt like she was a little kid. And then, you know, it was a really fun phase. It felt like a phase you guys on the podcast have heard me a million times. Like I like to come up with like systems for things like Friday night, we do pizza and a movie or after school, once a week we go get Starbucks. And this is the way, this is our routine. This is our ritual. This is how we do things. And all that really started to click into place probably about that three, five, seven age range. And that's where we've been for the last few years. And there's a lot that I've enjoyed about that. And it's given me the ability to have more, uh, what are we, what are we saying? Like consistent standardized rules is maybe the wrong word, but like, this is how we do this. Um, but I don't, I think that took a while. I think in the first few years, it was very yeah. much about the individual kid. Well, let, let's unpack that a little bit because yeah. when you really look at that with the, with the, you know, little ones, it's not just about the fact that their needs are so in your face, like, they literally need you to do almost everything for them or guide them into everything. Um, there's not as much choice, I guess, when they're like really little like that. But also you don't have the, like you don't have the headspace right. to even start thinking about what is our family going to like how when they're one, three and five or one, four and you know seven. You're going to be so caught up in just the work of doing the parenting job. Mm -hmm that you probably aren't even going to get to that like next stage on the hierarchy of right. needs. <laughs> right. So like it's about them and it's about you. And right. I think for me, what became tricky was I had kids moving into the age where I really wanted to create that, mm -hmm. but I still had little ones hanging out in yeah. the down, you know, in the toddler years. And I was like, well, how do I do both? Yeah. And I, probably, I think I just, I just kind of, well, I, I had like almost like two sets of rules. We mm -hmm. talked about this recently where someone was saying he felt like he had two sets of kids, yes, like the older set and the younger. And that really was kind of how like, my three, five and seven year old, for example, or in my case, it would have been four, six and I don't remember how old they were. It would have been like the, the two older ones were two years apart. Then there was like a three and a half year gap. <clears throat> Those three may have had different expectations of them as a group than the little ones. Right. As a group. Yeah. Like the little ones may have been allowed to leave the dinner table early because that way I actually got to talk to the three older ones or yeah. whatever it was. Um, but even so, even that can start to fall apart. Yeah. Because like, it's not just about. Like there's so many individuals to keep yeah. track of. Well, and, and let's be honest, this is like, could be a whole other episode, but even when trying to meet the individual stages of each child, there is often a child or two who demand more of you in that stage right. of life. And that can bring up a lot of stress and guilt 
for parents. I mean, that's, yeah. that's like a whole other. So even if you say, you know, I'm, I'm mostly kind of meeting them each where they are. It's not, it's not equal time. Usually right. somebody's the squeaky wheel at any given yeah. moment. Well, so you mentioned um, Violet being mad because she can't do the things that <laughs> Allegra can do. And they have a six year age gap or five. five yeah. Four and a half. Yeah, five. five. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so <laughs> what do you do when, when they call you out? And I'm sure there's a million ways I can totally see Reed being very detail oriented mm-hmm. in the way that he um, observes. Yes. Like snacks yes. and other things being handed out. So like, what do you do? So a big thing I do now is let let them come up with solutions themselves. This wouldn't have worked a few years ago. They were there was too much power inequity um, and too many tears, like too too many right. emotions close to the surface. But now I really can say, well, first of all, let's let's put it out there. It comes in the form of the littlest things. She got more. Yesterday we got two cookies, but now today you're only saying we can have one. But I saved my cookie from yesterday, so can I have two today because it's really yesterday's cookie? I mean, you guys know like yeah. the the and yep, uh, yeah. And I may, maybe I've enabled this because I do. I kind of welcome their ideas and their input, and we talk a lot. And like, so maybe maybe if I had a more authoritative style, they just wouldn't bother. But um, for whatever reason, we do a lot of this. Or she got to do that. You know, now it's my turn, but I missed my turn last week and all of that. Um, So a lot of times I'll put it back on them and just say, well, why don't you guys come up with a solution that seems fair? And a lot of the times that works. They um, they have been through this enough to pretty much like there's checks and balances within the three of them. I still have to listen to the fighting and the arguing, but at least I'm not in the middle of it. So um, that's one thing I do. In terms of like when we were talking about uh, age differences, so like things with like chores and responsibilities, for example, is is a good place where the older you get, you get more, you have to do more with chores and responsibilities, but you might get more freedoms. And so I think I'm just constantly reminding like, well, you know, Allegra gets to stay up later, but she also has an hour of homework. Would you like an hour of homework? <laughs> or <Yeah. laughs> like do you, it, all, it all, I find myself saying it all evens out in the end, guys. Yeah. It all evens out in the end. Um, And then another thought is I think we're pretty good in our family. We, we try to talk openly about how great it is that everybody's different and everybody's working on something different, including adults. So for example, uh, Reed is, he's not overly, I've talked about this when we talk about chores, he's not overly helpful. It, It doesn't come from a natural place of wanting to be helpful. So he really has to be pushed to do chores and he'll often complain. Like, it's like, oh, and complain the first time. Why do I have to do this? Blah, blah, blah. So just recently I asked him to take the garbage bins out to the curb, which is actually a pretty big job for him because he's still pretty little. And he just got up and did it without pushing back, without asking why. And when he came back in, I kind of made a big deal. I was like, buddy, that was like, I really noticed you just, you did it. You didn't push back, blah, blah, blah. And I noticed the girls were looking at me like, dude, I do what you ask me to all the time. (laughs) Why is he getting Mm -hmm. a party? And so I just took the opportunity to explain. I was like, look, guys, Reed's working on, you know, doing things the first time without pushing back. And it's, it's a struggle for him. It doesn't come easy for him. So I did want to acknowledge that. I also appreciate when you guys do it the first time without being asked, but it's not hard for you. So it's less of a, it's less of a celebration. And then we use the example of Allegra has a hard time staying on task in the morning. So if she had a really smooth morning or really improved in that area, then I'd be kind of celebrating that where that's not hard for someone else. So I think It's part of our family dialogue that everybody's got their struggles and their strengths. And when I assign a a job, a chore, or if I reward something or compliment something, it's never going to be equal because it's that's where it really is about kind of growing each person in their own way. Yeah, I love that. I'm curious if you have any sort of rules of thumb about ages um, that kids can do certain things like get an allowance, get a cell phone, get their ears pierced. I know that that has come to bite me yeah. when I've made like declarations about you have to wait till X age. And then I decide I want to move the age for my own purposes. Yeah. So I'm curious how that's played out in your so family. So it's, it's kind of new, right? Because my oldest right. is 11 and I've been winging it as we all do with our oldest, because that's yep. all, you know. So there are things that she has done at a certain age. And I've thought in the back of my mind, Hmm, should I declare this as like, this is the powers family yeah. rule. So an allowance is a funny one because we waited a long time and not for any good reason. I was just lazy and I didn't want to deal with it. 
And so finally it was, she turned 11 and started middle school. And I was like, well, I think that's when you start getting an allowance in the Powers family. That one I think will probably be okay because um, we don't tie our allowances to chores. And unless I have an 11 year old, who's just, I guess, like really not ready to handle money or something. Mm -hmm. But I have been careful about that with other things, because like you said, it could totally come back to bite you. I wish that I had, we have an episode about arbitrary rules and Mm -hmm. there's some fun little things. I think, so I guess my point is, I think it's fun to do that with low stakes things. Like I've told the story on the podcast before about my friend Stacy who has four kids and she has a rule in her family that when you turn four you don't get to choose the color of your cup anymore I was like well that would have saved me seriously like years of my life like that is so little things like that I actually think it's fun you're the mom you get to decide like maybe when you turn five um there's some kind of crazy celebration or I have friends who you get a birthday party with your classroom friends um, at certain on like five, nine, 13. Like you, th- that's about arbitrary rules. And I feel like that is a blank slate. You get to totally do that. But I would be careful probably about doing it with things that have a more of a maturity threshold. So I haven't well, done it that, too much. That and, and with your allowance example, you may have the case where an 11 year old isn't mature enough to handle money. And that would be one Side, but you may also have the case, the 10 year old who is super motivated to save money. Right. Um, and I could see one of your kids going yeah. in that direction and being like, well, I really, it's really important to me. I want to buy this Lego kit and it's a hundred dollars right? and I want to save money for it. How can I do that? And I, it's interesting when you see kids who are beyond their years with some maturity thing, like there, there's something that like they're beyond their age and they feel so trapped by being kids and you can't help but like, feel for them because you want them to be able to express this thing they're naturally good at and motivated to do, but you've already set up this rule. Like (laughs) you've already created this standard. So for me, those things have always been moving targets. And I'm just like, really like with my kids, I, I will just be like, yep, sorry. You had to wait till you were 13 to get a cell phone. Well, guess what? (sighs) Cell phones were harder to come by then. They were more unusual. Yeah. Um, you weren't, Like our family wasn't as mobile as it is now. It's just different now. So yes, your 10 year old sister has a phone. Sorry, deal with it. Yeah. And I think, yes. I mean, I, we have that conversation all the time and that's where I I, saying it all evens out in the end. And I don't even know if it does. Does it? Is it all equal? I don't know. I get probably doesn't. I give my mom a hard time because our school lunches that she packed were ridiculously healthy when I was really little, like the most seedy whole wheat, peanut butter, like no sugar. And then my sister's eight and a half years younger and got Doritos. And we still like, we still are like, I, I did not like touch a Dorito ever, like regularly, except at a birthday party or something. And then they were just in the pantry. And so we all, that's part of family lore and culture. Yes. And we've done episodes about birth order, our own birth order and our kids' birth order. And you guys should go listen to those. But like, it isn't perfect. And there for sure are, are like ramifications, but I'm not sure there's much to do about it, except acknowledge that it's not going to be the same for each kid. And it's not, I don't think it's our job as moms to be the, the final say on, okay, there, I did it. I raised three kids and everything yes. turned out fair. <laughs> like I just everything was fair and equal. Yeah. And, and also like in the case of your lunch um, example, like you could argue that you both got something really valuable out yes. of that. Like you got really healthy lunches and that's <laughs> fantastic. But your sister got the experience of being like kind of the cool kid in the classroom right. with like Doritos at the lunch table. And probably having a bit of a more relaxed mom because she's throwing her hands up in the air about some things. So (laughs) like you both benefited in totally different ways. Um, You mentioned birth order. Do you think the way you, both the way that you handle these questions is related to your birth order, birth order and to your kid's birth order or one or the other? I mean, I think we can't help but have our first kid be the guinea pig for a lot of this. And then subsequent kids we compare. And so I think, I don't know how to avoid that, except that, um, I think it does, it does make a difference when we talk about these, um, setting up family rules or family guidelines or maturity thresholds for things. You just, you just have to know that the next kid may not, the the first one is not the model by which the others are carbon copies. And I I think most of us know that, but depending on how you were raised or what your own sibling experience, I think, um, adults who are only children, this, this is challenging. And I have some close friends who are only children, um, because this whole concept that every kid is so different. And like, I might have to parent each kid differently. 
I think to me feels a little bit more native because I grew up in a family mm. of three kids who are very, very different and we're parented pretty differently. Um, but I think if you were an only child or maybe like two sisters who were pretty similar and everything was kind of the same, that could be, that could be more jarring. But yeah, I mean, you can't not, birth order can't not be a part of it, I think. Well, that, and your experience as an oldest means that your experience of being parented was being parented probably with stricter yep. rules yep. and more guidelines and, and structure than like me as the youngest. So yes. I'm just naturally more relaxed about a lot yes. of things than probably you are inclined to be. Yeah. And I also, I also think because of the spacing, I have memories of my parents um, parenting. Does that make sense? Like mm-hmm. I have memories of my parents making parenting decisions and family rules decisions, almost like I was a little bit of a mini adult because of my, because of the eight and a half year space that when I was a teenager, there were, you know, just things would happen the way that they handled things with my brother or sister. So I, that's very different. Cause I don't think as a youngest, you would not really have much of a memory of your parents parenting. Does that make sense? No, like I making no parenting <laughs> decisions and yes. Um, yeah. Whereas I do because they were in the thick of it and I was the yeah. oldest. So all of my knowledge of being parented comes from people telling me how I was parented. <laughs> that's, that's I mean, I really don't know. You know what I mean? Like I kind of remember by the time I was eight or nine or 10, but like all those little formative years and yeah. like I was, I was just there. Like, you know, you're playing um, outside. I was playing outside. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> being tied to a tree. <laughs> oh, fancy. Um, I do have another question about that, or I guess just an idea or a thought about this idea of there being a unit. And I remember something I heard once, and I'm sorry, I can't credit who said this, but it was something like, you know, a relationship is never 50, 50. It's, it's a hundred and a hundred. It's both people bringing a hundred percent. Right. So like much like that, it's not like you look at your unit of kids and you're like, well, the three of you each have to give 33.3333%. Right. It's like everyone gives their version of a hundred percent. And somehow you get this like sloppy hole. Yeah. (laughs) Which is the beauty of family life, but it's not, it's not ever going to look like a pie with three equal slices. Yes, I agree. And I also agree that it's not either, or you're not the type of parent who sets standards and doesn't waver versus the type of parent who does everything completely custom. I think there has to be a little bit of both. And I think when I was trying to like boil this down into where I, where I, what I believe, I believe I am running one household and I'm like the primary active, like at home parent for one set of kids. And there are some things that are kind of standardized about that, but Mm -hmm. I am also in relationship with three totally different human beings. And both of those things can be true at the same time. Yeah. Also you are a human being, right? And so is your husband. Turns out. So turns out like, (laughs) and I'm not suggesting that kids should bear the brunt of their parents, you know, imperfections, but we have them, we Uh all have them and they're all different. So like your strengths, like you and Brian are just two people. Yeah. So you don't bring all the strengths in the world to the table either. Right. Like you both have weaknesses and yeah. it's not like you two perfectly balance each other out and create like a whole pie either. You know what right. I mean? So it's like, it, it's, we put these weird standards on ourselves. Like we have to be everything to our kids. And then somehow by like seeing that, then they have to become like their own, like little complete version yeah. of everything. And it's just not. That's a lot. That ain't a lot to handle. It is a lot. (laughs) That's a lot. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. 
Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash mom hour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Extra 25% when you keep everything in your box. That's an amazing deal. Again, it's stitchfix.com slash the mom hour and you'll save an extra 25% when you decide to keep everything in your first box. We're welcoming back paintyourlife.com today as a sponsor. And I have to say that when I heard this company takes one of your photos and commissions a professional artist to then create a painting from it, I thought, A, that's such a great gift idea, but B, that's obviously super expensive because original artwork can be so pricey. But it turns out paintyourlife.com pieces are very affordable and wait till you guys hear the discount we're giving you. Also, the quality is amazing. So if you're looking for a meaningful gift, you've got to check it out. Yeah. So the way this works is you upload a favorite photo to paintyourlife.com and they'll help you commission an original painting based on that photo. It can be a picture of your kids, a beloved pet, or maybe a special place. And what you'll get is an actual painting done by hand by a world-class artist. You get to choose your style of painting, like they have oil or acrylic. And you also choose the artist whose work you most admire and work with them throughout the process until every detail is perfect. And there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded. I got a landscape of the boys playing at the beach last summer. And another thing I thought was really cool is that the website made it really easy for me to figure out which medium was best for my photo. So a lot of times photos of Lake Michigan get a little washed out because it's basically like blue sky on blue water on beige sand. So I chose acrylic because the colors are more saturated in acrylic paintings. And I love it. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. And right now as a limited time offer, you're going to get 30% off your painting. That's right. 30% off and free shipping. So to get the special offer, text the word mom to 797979. That's mom to 797979. Again, you're going to text M-O-M to 797979. Um, just keep in mind that message and data rates may apply. Okay. So I did most of the talking in the first half. Um, that was really fun, actually. I think it's a, it is a unique stage that I'm in right now. And I want to know how this changes in the teenage and young adult years. Cause I'm, I'm guessing that Will and Owen and they're not arguing over like who got the last cookie. Maybe they are. Not but, as directly. Anymore. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. So tell me what, how this has been in the teen and young adult years in this whole idea of kind of family rules, standards versus meeting the individual needs. Sure. Well, so I'll start with Will and Owen. And, and I guess just to give the overall, the nice thing is we've all been doing this long enough that they know what my non-negotiables are. And those, so the things you talked about, like the family rules, like no cell phones at the table or whatever those rules are, we've been hammering those for so long that those aren't the kind of things that come into question so much anymore. It's the more nebulous stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just to use Will and Owen as an example, because they are the two teenagers remaining. And how old are they? Um, for those? They are 15 and 13. Okay. My other two boys are now both in their 20s, which is mm-hmm. hard to believe. Um, but they're so different. Okay. So like, and I've, I've seen this play out, but when I was really thinking about this, I realized like Will asks much, but gives back much. So he wants to be driven places. He wants to have friends over. He wants things like he's more materialistic than um, his brothers really have ever been. But he also is the first to do a chore when asked, do a chore without being asked, do something right, jump on. You know, like he mm-hmm. sees a need and jumps in. Now, Owen, on the other <laughs> hand, makes very few asks, but he's the first to try to get out of a chore. Mm-hmm. Like I have to have like I have to ride him. So for me, it's like I feel like they're those are both strategies for them. Like to William, it's more important to to get what he wants, which is socialization mm-hmm. and his social status is very important to him um, and hang with his friends and have the new shirt that he wants or whatever. So because that's important to him, he's willing. He sees the balance and what needs to happen for him to feel, I guess, OK about making those requests, whereas mm-hmm. Owen doesn't really care about that stuff as much. Right. So like in like he'll make a joke, like he'll say, you know, can I can I have a friend over today? And I'll say, oh, yeah, but, you know, your room's kind of a mess. So if you want to have your friend over, you really got to clean your room. And he'll be like, yeah, never mind. So for him, <laughs> I have, I have some like kids like that. too. <laughs> yes. So the equalizer is that I have to be careful not to ever do something for William that I wouldn't also do for Owen. So like Will doesn't get preferential treatment because he's, quote, good, unquote. Uh-huh. Right. Um, it's almost more like a self-selecting thing they've done. And also, if I notice Owen really slacking, I don't let him to get away with it just because he flies under the radar. Like, right, I have just because be he careful. hasn't asked for a new shirt. He right. still has to occasionally He still clean has his to room. pony up and clean his room. And so, yeah, he might not have to clean it in the next half hour because he's got a friend coming over, but it still has to get done. Yeah. And I ha- they will laugh. Like, there's just this, this um, 
kind of joke in the house that anytime I see, I like lay eyes on someone, I ask them to do something. <laughs> so they'll be like, oh, I shouldn't have come out of my room. And I was like, well, eventually, and Will just comes out of his room more because he just has more stuff that he wants to interact with me about. It's just how it is. So he gets asked to do a lot of stuff. And then I'll say, well, Will, you know, I would have asked eventually, I would have asked Owen to do that. And then I have to make sure that's true because sometimes yeah. it's not true. That's the way I'd like to think is true. But sometimes there's a kid in front of me and I know that kid will do the thing. That's the kid I ask mm -hmm. to do the thing. So it's not, at these ages, it's not like the million little decisions that have to be made every day because I'm not in there like hovering while they brush their teeth or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like, I'm not even hearing them fight. Like if they're squabbling about stuff, like they have a shared bedroom. So if they're not agreeing about how to use the space, I might not even know about it. But what I do know or what I can pick up on is when we're all sitting around the dinner table or when we're all in the living room hanging out, am I picking up on friction and tension? And are there ways I can help the kids resolve tensions, even though I don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sometimes it's just bringing a different energy to our interactions. So like time that we all spend together, it's important to me that it's peaceful and fun. And I don't mean in a fake way, like we're all going to fake it through yeah. this like teeth clenched. But like literally when we come to the, the dinner table or when we sit on the sofa, we literally are all being this family unit, cracking jokes, getting along. And then five minutes after we get up, like the kids might be low level kind of digging at each other again. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I feel like that's kind of the nature of what they're working out as teenagers and their relationships mm -hmm. and lots of people in one small house and all of those things. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in hearing all their petty complaints, but that doesn't mean if they have something real to talk about, they won't bring it to me. So we're in a really interesting place with the boys. And I remember this being kind of the same with Jacob and Isaac around this age where they liked each other. We all loved spending time together, but they also had a lot. They just had a lot to talk about. They had a lot of things to work through. And a lot of yeah. personality differences. And a lot of personality are... differences. So I'm curious, like, I remember when I was a teenager, for example, my brother, two years younger, the rule, the te the house rules around teenagers, which at that time was like, you know, curfews and mm -hmm. I guess like a little bit of dating or whatever, were very, they, they were made up as we went yeah. because my parents had two teenagers who were socializing and being out in the world very differently. I'm curious if that's come up like you probably didn't start out to say, well, you know, you're allowed to, I don't know. I'm just making things up. Yeah, but curfews no. and dating and like, it kind of has to like, it has to respond to the issues that present themselves. Yeah. Really. I don't know many people anymore who say you can date when you're 16 and you yeah. know, like your curfew will be 1230. At least in my house, it, it was kind of a response to what was going on and what, what the kids were wanting to do and ready for. That's like completely the way it is now. I will say that socializing in general for teenagers is so different now than the way it was when we were kids. Um, I think I've said on the show before that I was well into the teen years with Owen and or Jacob and Isaac when I realized I'd never set a curfew because they never came home late. Like yeah. it never occurred to me the, the one or two times they came home after 11, it was some, you know, pre like we arranged it. It was like a school event right. or something. I knew about it. It just wasn't a thing. Like they socialized so differently than I did in high school. And I haven't quite seen how that's going to play at Williams only in 10th grade. I have a feeling he's going to push it a little harder. Mm -hmm. He's going to want a car early. Like he's, you know, he's mm -hmm. just a little more on it. And so for him, I will have to be more strict probably right. than I was with the others. And um, Williams also someone I've had to really make a point of saying, you don't just get to go someplace without asking. Like you don't just get to go home with someone after school right. without checking with me. I never had to say that to the older boys. Right. Like it was just assumed like they would never... Yeah. So it's just very, um, yes, different. A will or Isaac had a girlfriend at like 14. I don't remember being quite prepared for that. I was like, what? Next, <laughs> he's asking me to drive him and his girl to the movies and drop them off. And he, of my knowledge, is the only one of the boys to really have like a steady girlfriend. And he and then he had another one. So that, that was just the way he did things like he yeah. was that type. Whereas so far, like Jake was not that type and William so far hasn't been that type. So it's yeah, it's definitely case by case. And I have no problem with that. And so yeah. far, because I'm not coming out with this like super strict standard, no one's given me any guff because it doesn't feel unfair. Right. I'm really not saying no very much. You know what I mean? But yeah. The, yeah. the asks are not being very they're not very high. So I really haven't had to say no very much. yet. Well, and that kind of leads to my next question, which was I talked a lot about the, you know, he got this, she got that. Um, yeah. it, I, I heard you mention it briefly about like Clara getting a cell phone younger and yeah. this whole, like the, the age difference of when, when certain things happen. But, um, does that come up a lot with the current yeah. teenagers? 
So the good news is that the dickering that you were describing does kind of start to go away. I mean, it's still, it's not, the dickering goes away. What still happens is the negotiating. So like Mm -hmm. I have a box of cookies and I mentally do the math. There's 10 cookies in the box. Everybody gets, you know, two, whatever it is like, you know, and then I'll hear someone kind of go, oh, well, I see that there's, you know, only three left, which means somebody already ate all theirs. I'm like, (laughs) so does that mean, or can I eat one of them now and the other one tomorrow? It just, it becomes all this like negotiating where I don't really care that much anymore because they're not arguing about it. It's a little bit different. And in reality, all the boys can go get themselves a cookie if they want one. I'm not going to stop them. They can go to the store. And even Clara, um, at 10 years old, has a lot more autonomy over her life than she did even a year or two ago. So like, I feel like, as kids start to feel more in control of their surroundings and what they have access to, some of that goes away because who cares? Yeah. Like it just becomes less, they're not noticing it, blah, blah, blah. Um, They do notice contributions. So like they notice when one kid is always the one who works harder or Mm -hmm. seems to get more chores, that stuff does come up. Um, they make jokes about the phone thing. Like, Oh mom, Clara has a phone already. Well, I remember I didn't get to have one until 13, but I mean, (laughs) They don't, the the people who didn't get to have one until they were 13 are adults now. So it's kind of said with, it's good natured and it's not. um, It's like the Doritos in my Exactly. (laughs) It's like part of the family lore. And, you know, it's like us ribbing my brother because he was the only kid who got to play hockey. And my parents got him like $800 worth of hockey equipment, which is funny (laughs) because in 1970s, that was probably the equivalent of like $5,000. So I'm sure it really wasn't that much money. But every time we talk about it, it becomes more. (laughs) <laughs> like, oh, the remember, million dollar yeah, hockey bag. Well, I remember he got $17,000 worth of <laughs> hockey equipment and I didn't even get to play soccer. So whatever it was, like it becomes that story that just keeps like kind of growing. And so next thing you know, they'll be saying Clara had a phone at six and they had to wait till they were 18 to get right. theirs, which is not right. the case. Um, and, you know, they notice like there's one kid that hugs the snacks up and all that. I think the biggest difference is they are noticing, but they're not looking to me to be the decider anymore. Yeah, that's It's not my job anymore. Like they work stuff out between themselves. They police each other. They hold each other responsible. When they were little, I didn't like that because I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm the boss. Like you guys don't get to decide. Like you don't get to now between the two of you make a trade, a cookie today for, you know, some treat next week because they were little. And like, I felt like I still wanted to have that control over what was happening. But now- I'm like, well, this is kind of how human relationships work. And yes. I don't want a police who got the cookie. Yeah. I'd rather they were to that themselves. for 12 years. I did yeah. that. And I, I don't need to do that anymore. They don't come to me for that kind of stuff anymore unless they really can't work it out. Um, and they're, you know, there's, we have a big family. There's lots of older people in this family. So there is like some infighting and grappling and all that, but I can see that they like each other. I can see they enjoy spending time together. So I'm kind of like, that's the family standard I was going for the whole time. Like yeah. the individual ones are between me and the kid, like each individual kid. And I am seeing definitely a big difference between how much help and guidance even the adult children need. But it yeah. does, it is kind of gratifying to see that there doesn't seem to be a lot of tension or resentment around it. I love that. I mean, yeah. that's like, I think you've painted a picture that a lot of us aspire to, which is these humans in your house that need you a lot less, but you still get to enjoy watching them have their own relationships yeah. with each other and to continue to develop the relationship with you. Yeah. So that's kind of where I want to go next, yeah. which is let's talk about, especially the the older two who are 20 and almost 22, right? Yeah. Or 20 and 22. Uh, 20 and yeah. almost 22. Jacob will be 22 in November. Yeah. Like what does the relationship look like? And I guess specifically you've had to kind of redefine what you're influences because, you know, we started the show talking about me and three little kids and, you know, having micro influence over everything. Yeah. And now we're at the other end of the spectrum. So what does it look like? Yeah. And I think what's interesting, I want to say like in a recent episode, we mentioned that, or maybe it was just you and I talking, but I was saying that with a young adult, with like school-aged kids, um, their lives kind of all look the same. They all go to school. Right. They all come home. Maybe one of them does more sports or one of them has different grades. But that kind of tends to be something I think we internally notice in our own homes and isn't quite like blasted out to the world. Right. Then they become adults like young adults. And then suddenly the differences become so apparent because they could go to college. They could go to community college. They could go. They could work. They could do nothing. Um, Like it's just they have like so many options available available to them. So 
what's interesting to me is that my second oldest was the one who was dying to get out and be on his own as soon as possible. And so he's been basically self-sufficient for like a year. Um, he got a full-time job making good money, like for a kid his age, really good money. And decided to move into an apartment, like a real grown up apartment that he lived in alone for a while. Now he's living with some friends and much happier. I don't think he liked living alone, but <laughs> like he didn't even have that transition, like of living in a dorm or yeah. whatever. He like just did it. And I think he understood that if he needed it, more help would be available and that it's something he's chosen. So I do think that that makes the difference between him and Jacob, who's definitely needing and wanting more help. Um, not like, not at the point of tension it may be, but I have to look out for that, right? Because first of all, I have to make sure I'm doing this dance to say like, okay, so Jacob's older. He seems to need more help. Does he need the help or does he just want the help? Is, mm-hmm. Does he want it only because it makes his life easier? You know, mm-hmm. like, so it's this mm-hmm. balancing act. He's taking some college classes um, and just getting those, like getting him signed up for that was, it was like a team effort between his dad and I. We had to do a lot of nudging and all out doing. And so- I will say one thing I'm really grateful for is that having so many kids kind of forced me to recognize how different they are all early on. Mm -hmm. And I'm also really grateful that my oldest doesn't exhibit a lot of the typical firstborn behaviors, because I think then I would hold him up as like the example (laughs) to which everybody else would be compared. And I think that that, especially in a big family, can be really unhealthy road to go down. Um, I'm really glad that that kind of got flipped. Mm -hmm. So. On the other hand, do I get kind of frustrated? Yeah, I have found that it's helpful to go out of my way to like ask other people with young adults um, how things are going with them rather than talking to people who don't have young adults. I know that sounds Mm. so obvious when I say it like that, but people with teenagers have a lot of opinions about how they would parent young adults. Yeah, just like just like a person with a four year old has an opinion about how they would parent a 10 year old. It's because everyone wants to think their kid is going to be the easiest and best, right? Yeah. They all want to think that whatever they're doing is going to lead to like this fantastic result and they don't have any context or actual experience with it. So I do find that to be like, when I'm feeling out like, where is the, like, where is the spectrum of normal um, versus worrisome? Like that to me is really helpful just to talk to other people who are actually going through it. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, the other side, when it comes to someone like Isaac, who's always flown under the radar, he's always been someone who asks very little. And I know that there could be reasons for that that I'm not really thinking about because he makes my life easy. So I have to stop and think, like, did he move out because he really just wanted this life on his own? Or is it because he's suffocated with all these siblings or he wants to distinguish himself from his brother? Or maybe he worries that I won't have like enough money (laughs) to help Mm -hmm. him. Like, Like, or maybe he doesn't feel he can ask for anything. So like, I really have to think about those things, even though he's an adult now. Um, I still find myself like going out of my way to find ways to like help or parent him that don't look like helping or parenting. Um, Yeah, I can, I can just to jump in. Sure. I I can relate to that as a very unsqueaky wheel, just Mm -hmm. as someone who was super self-sufficient. Um, my, I mean, really my whole life, Yeah. (laughs) but especially as a teenager and young adult, Um, that I think it was probably hard for my parents to figure out how to parent me because I was really good at parenting myself. And I didn't, it wasn't like a conscious thing. Like I didn't say, I don't want to bother them or like, there was nothing like that, but I, I, it just, I was, it's the way I was wired. Um, and so then I think that does present like, then what is the, what is the way that you help or nurture is a good word or, or support if, if that you know, super independent, self-sufficient kid isn't asking for it versus a kid who's needing and asking for a lot. And then, and then all the questions you brought up with Jacob, like, is it, is it too much? Is it, you know, a dependency thing, whatever. So it is very interesting, but I was very much the kid that didn't on the outside appear to need any parenting, Yeah, you know, probably from the time I was 15 on. Yeah. Isaac's been that way for a long time. Um, And, you know, I'm not always the best because I have so much else going on. Sometimes I have to really stop myself and think, wow, like for a while he was coming home almost every weekend. So I was at least getting to make him a dinner on Sunday and and talk to him. And now he's been hanging out with these other friends, which is good for him. Like I want Mm -hmm. him to have his buddies up in Grand Rapids. So he's like an hour and a half away. But um, for his birthday, I went and took him to lunch because I was like, I can't not see. We had like a family lunch and cake 
on Sunday, but that wasn't his actual birthday. And I was like, I can't not see him on his birthday. So I drove up and took him to lunch. And then he mentioned that he wanted to start cooking and he likes this um, pork hash I make with sweet potatoes. And so I was like, oh, well, maybe I got home and thought, you know what? One nice thing I could do is just like, first of all, I know he doesn't have a Dutch oven and I know he doesn't have a chef's knife. So I bought one on Amazon and had it shipped to his house. And then I just typed out the recipe like really clearly, like yeah. <laughs> do, first do this, second do this. Because Wash if, your hands. Yes. And it feels really overwhelming to make. It's a super simple meal, but it's got a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Um, and I thought he'll, he would never ask me to do that. He would never yeah. buy those things for himself. But like, that's just one little way I could be like, hey, I see you. Yeah. I, yeah, like, I, I want that. to make your life a little easier or more fun or whatever. Yeah. Um, Dave's car broke down. Like he's suddenly facing all these adult like adulting problems, yeah. right? Like this is real, real world stuff. Yeah. And he's like on the side, I'm on the side. I pulled over on the side of the road to text with him because he was texting me. And of course I couldn't text and drive. And I, I don't think he was even going to tell me about it, but I was just happened to be on the way home. And he was like, my car just broke down. So I kind of had to coach him and say like, when you call the mechanic, this is what you're going to ask. Like, this is how you get your car towed. So like, it, ni- it feels nice to be a little bit needed. Yeah. But sometimes I have to, gently insert myself yeah without being overbearing which is not yeah like always easy to do I want to mention as an aside and I'd actually be really curious to hear from other moms of teens and young adults about this but I don't know if this is a cultural trend right now but my kids are obsessed with financial stability and college debt like they talk about it a lot and it's actually colored a lot of the conversations we've had around college and like what they're going to do after school in a way that I don't remember entering into the conversation when I was a kid like at Mm -hmm. all like the first question is how much will that cost? How much can I make? And I, I think it's kind of a sad sign of the times that they're growing yeah. up in that they're so focused on it. But sometimes I have to remind myself that they don't have any perspective about money. So when I mm-hmm. say things like, Hey, like these community college classes, it's really fine. Like I can swing it. It's not that much. Right. Like, mm-hmm. because to them college is like this yeah. big thing that you're going to go in debt in for the rest of your life. And, right. and they're just like, I forget sometimes that they, and I think it's easy to forget that they're hearing all the same cultural messages that we are about Mm -hmm. mounting debt and, Mm -hmm. you know, the price of education and and job outlooks, but they don't have years of experience to filter it through. And they don't, they don't have the appreciation of nuance, like, right. Like (laughs) that there's that may, that could be true, but there's a whole spectrum of the ways in which it is true. Yes. Um, and that, and that the, the great pendulum of time like swings, uh, you know, both directions so that it's not, yeah, it's not a prescription necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, just one thing to put on people's radars as your kids move into that, they're going to, they're going to hear about it. Um, I was, I sat in either back to school night with um, Will's AP history class uh, teacher who spent a lot of the time talking about college debt, like a lot of it and saying Hmm. he felt like it was his job as an AP teacher to help kids like avoid some of that by getting them prepared for college and scholarships and and the AP class can count for some college credit and stuff like that. So I was like, wow, like they're really getting it from all sides. And so it's just something on my radar now with the younger ones, like when Mm -hmm. they're talking about the their futures just to make sure I jump in with some reassurance. Like, yeah, no, I'm not wealthy, you know, but, but we can figure this out. Um, don't panic. And I, yeah. like, I do feel like there's this low level anxiety and panic just kind of in the water right now with young adults. So it's just something to kind of look out for. And I'm curious if others, I would actually really like to hear from other parents if they've noticed that or experienced it. Yeah, please. Hello at the mom hour.com yeah. as always. That's how you reach us. Yes. Um, okay. Well, it's time to wrap up, but that was really, really cool and interesting. And thank you. It for was. Sharing. And my voice didn't completely yeah. crap out. No, you, you are still here. With <laughs> here, us. I, here I am, guys. <laughs> so at the end of every show, we like to um, recommend something for you to go scroll back and listen to from our very vast archives. And so today for Cue It Up, I picked an episode from January of 2017. And it's called How and Why to Spend One-on-One Time with Your Kids. Um, So both different, but also complementary, I think, to this. And if I remember right, we probably spent a lot of time focusing on the little ones because in the little years, you're like, how How? and why would I possibly want to like set aside time for a game of Candyland when I'm with this human 
all day long. But we kind of looked at some of the research and we made a case for why even little bits of dedicated one on one time that's really led by the kid Mm. and their interests is actually different. And then I I believe (laughs) I'm guessing because it was us that we then moved on into what that looks like as kids get older. And so I thought that would be a nice compliment and probably here some similar strains, but from almost three years ago to what yeah. we talked about today. Well, That's and it fits, one. right? Because the more when I'm, the more time, the more you're able to get to know your child individually, however you do that, the better I think you get at doing this juggling and this balancing yeah. act between their needs and everybody else's. The family unit. Yep. Um, well, again, Hannah, thank you for such an insightful question made for a great conversation. Um, I want to also welcome new listeners really quickly because I have a feeling there are a bunch of you, at least that's what our, that's um, what our numbers seem to be. That's what our us. numbers seem to suggest. <laughs> and I never look at Apple podcast rankings because they're um, n- not super indicative of anything usually, but um, we're right up there in the parenting category right now. So hi guys, welcome. Um, just want to point you to the momhour.com and we have a special page for new listeners. That's just the momhour.com slash new, or it's right at the top of the page in the navigation bar. And there, there's a whole bunch of episode recommendations. If you are um, overwhelmed by the 300 plus episodes in our what? archives, but you want to get to know us <laughs> on that page, it kind of divides things up by topic and stage of life. There's stuff for new mom stuff for full-time working mom stuff about pregnancy Um, So wherever you are, we've kind of curated a list for you. So check it out if you haven't, or even if you've been listening for a while and are working your way through, that's a fun page to browse because you might see something that is otherwise hard to parse out. So, And we will have you know that there are plenty of people working their way through the entire archive. So... I from think the you beginning. can do it if you want to. You can do it. <laughs> from I think the beginning. If you put your so mind to it, you can do it. <laughs> it seems like a popular approach is to start at the beginning, but also listen to new episodes as they drop. So I'm I'm trying to think if that was oh. me, would I like that? And I I kind of like it because I mean, yeah. if you're if you're a stay at home mom or you've got a long commute, you've got plenty of time to listen to podcasts. So you'd be chronologically getting to know us from the beginning. But then each time a new episode drops, you also listen to that. I don't know. I don't know how that would be, but I've heard several people tell us that that's what they do. So I think that's interesting. Hmm. All right, guys. Well, as always, everything we talked about will be linked up in the show notes at themomhour.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Mom Hour. We'd love to see you there. And Megan, thanks for for showing up even with your froggy voice. It's okay. (laughs) Talk to you guys guys. soon. Hi everyone, Megan here. Sarah and I would absolutely love it if you would hit pause right now, like right where you're listening, and leave the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, this is one of the biggest ways you can thank us, and it really only takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, you can navigate to the Mom Hour's show listing. So when you're in the episode you're listening to right now, click where it says the Mom Hour just above the play button, and then scroll all the way to the bottom and you will see the ratings and reviews. We would love if you would leave us one as well. Thank you so much for listening. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code THEMOMHOUR at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour.